How much of this is a problem in India? Oh, I entirely agree with Paul, I think, you know. Whenever you come out with a new media technology, it will inevitably be used for pornography. For example, no, it is true. I mean, when Gutenberg invented the printing press, I was told that the first major usage was pornography. We actually, we actually did three things. After Gutenberg printed the Bible, what happened next? Cheap thrillers, yes. how-to books, and pornography. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, the point is, as Paul very rightly said, you know, this is about adolescence. In the beginning, it will always happen that a certain percentage of people will use it for purposes which may be at odd with the majority of the people. But that's a passing phase. It's got nothing to do with technology. So the important thing to look at is what are the positive uses that the technology is being put to for every person using internet for pornography, there are probably hundred people that are using it for way for new learning, you know, for finding solutions to their problems, for you know, creating communities, for sharing information, etc. etc. I would say that this will go away. This is just a passing phase. But it will continue to be there. It's not like it will not, it'll, nobody will be, nobody will ever use pornography through internet. It will be there, but that's normal. Okay. Uh, the last question before I open it up to the audience. Professor Safo, what is the next big thing in technology that you expect to see? Um, there are all sorts of things going on. Um, but let me, let me pick one that affects consumers, and, and I define big thing in a very specific way. Big thing is that thing that comes out of nowhere and everybody goes, oh my gosh, where'd that come from? You know, in the 1980s, the big thing was the personal computer, and you knew it was a big thing because, you know, the pimply-faced kids on the cover of Time and Newsweek and Business Week were... Steve Jobs, well, actually, he never had acne. Um, but, you know, Steve Wozniak, Bill Gates, he did have acne. Um, and then in the 90s, the big thing was the World Wide Web. And this time, the little geek boys on the cover were the Google twins, uh, the Yahoo founders, Jeff Bezos, and the like. The next big thing, with the little kids on the cover of the magazines, that everybody's going to go, oh, my gosh, where in the world did that come from, is going to be robots. That there is a, it, it may take a while, it may take five years, it may take seven years to start to arrive, and, and, and I should qualify this by saying uh, I don't think it's likely that we're going to have advanced robots that uh, uh, replace human beings or anything like that, but robots good enough for consumers to want. That's the next big thing. I mean, very simply, in the 1980s, thanks to cheap microprocessors, we invented the personal computer and brought it into our lives. In the 90s, thanks to the communications laser and bandwidth, we connected our computers together over the Internet and the web. In this decade, we're already well into the process of using sensor technologies, things like MEMS, RFID, cheap video, to put eyes, ears, and sensory organs on our computers. All we have to do is put some wheels on them and start moving them around, and they're going to be like robots. So. Bet on robots, it will be the next big thing that you'll see on the cover of magazines, but, uh, you know, may not be in the third term of the Bush administration. Next big thing is to move Well, term, well uh, <laughs> I would agree with uh, Paul that uh, robots probably would be the most likely big technology because of all the areas of artificial intelligence, the one area that has really yielded result is in robotics. Having said that, I do believe that the confluence of uh, genomics and medical research 
would certainly find cure for cancer and HIV AIDS, definitely. There is no doubt at all in possibly five to ten years. Certainly certain kinds of cancers, definitely. The, the third thing that I can think of in the coming years is the availability of access to information like electricity is ubiquitous today. Today you can get electricity wherever you go. You can get it in the form of batteries. You can go and plug yourself anywhere you want. I do believe that thanks to uh, huge databases, thanks to broadband wireless, thanks to miniaturization, we will be able to access huge amounts of data, no matter where you are. That's one. However, there is one major drawback today in accessing huge amounts of information uh, because our PDAs have a very small real estate on the screen. I believe that as we move forward and pretty soon we will have a mechanism whereby the PDA screen can be seen in the space in the form of a normal TV kind of stuff. So I hold the PDA, I press a button, and then I can, only I can see a big screen. In other words, the real estate of the PDA will not be an issue. With the result, you can actually use all the information that you access, make all the analysis, and, and come to conclusions, take decisions, all that, using, using the, the, the new technology, which I would call as uh, mobile decision making or ubiquitous decision making. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to now uh, invite questions from the audience, please. Wait for the mic, please. My question is when we get even more data than we are getting today, Will we manage to remain sane? Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, there are, I think there are a lot of things to worry about, but I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, I'd, I'd worry about whether Microsoft Windows will drive you crazy or not, but that's an easy solution, switch to Macintosh. Um, it, it, there has been a long concern in... in you know, well, Morsi mentioned the printing press. In the 1480s, uh, 20 years after Gutenberg uh, published the Bible, it triggered a, a problem with information overload. And there are wonderful passages of scholars complaining about uh, having to deal with all this information and books of suspect origin and, and the like. I think information overload is not a function of information at all. It is the second order derivative of the gap between the volume of information we have and the sense making tools we have to make sense of it. And, 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 and of course, the tools always lag behind the information. And that's why I'm sorry, Morty's here because he should be back at emphasis making those engineers work faster to give us those tools. But we will, we will catch up. You know, I think, I think the, the problem is not so much the availability of information, as Paul said. It's more about how well you can utilize it. For example, when you look at, when you watch a professor of mathematics solving very advanced uh, mathematics, you just wonder, how is this guy capable of doing it? On the other hand, when you have somebody in the primary school, you know, taking time to add two numbers or subtract two numbers, etc., it may appear to be very, very simple. So the issue is not so much the kind of information, the kind of data that is available, as how well we equip ourselves to use the data to 
come to better conclusions, to take better decisions, etc. And I, I am I'm very, very optimistic that uh, the human ingenuity is such that no matter what amount of data, what amount of information is available, there will be people who will discern patterns out of it and come to good conclusions. Yeah, we're, we're not going to lose our minds because of information, but we may lose our memory. Uh, the very real issue here is digital amnesia. A good friend of mine, Stuart Grant, likes to observe that information, lasts, information in digital form lasts forever or for five years, whichever comes first. Uh, we cannot read the tapes from the original Viking lander. All that data collected from Mars can't be read because there's no machine on the planet left to read the tapes. And besides, the iron filings are falling off the tape. Uh, there is a very real issue about digital amnesia, and we need to think about archival systems for preserving information. Uh, and, and actually, at a personal level, it probably gets worse. Uh, you know, all the kids putting all their MySpace pages up, and, and they say, well, it's not a problem because we're all doing it, so in 20 years we'll be equally embarrassed. Uh, I actually think we're headed into a very perverse world of digital information where the information we most want to preserve will be lost, and the information we most want to lose, those stupid emails that you were embarrassed about sending, will be preserved in perfect digital form to come back and haunt us again and again and again. So those digital pictures of you at the party, be very careful tonight. <laughs> Wonderful. Can you have more questions? Yes, please. My name is Santil Kumar. I head the Human Resources at Kane India Limited, Delhi. Uh, this is a question for Ms. Narayan Murthy. Um, explosion in technology and the props that we use today in the workplaces uh, has led to probably dehumanization at the workplace. How do you comment on it? You are a company known for your people practices, best known for being in close touch with individuals. You know, I, I am uh, very optimistic, I'm very positive. Let me look at the positive aspects of technology at the workplace. Uh, this morning, Nandan was probably somewhere here, I was in Delhi somewhere else, my colleague Mohan was in Bangalore, somebody else was in Boston. I. The, one of my colleagues sent a message and within half an hour all of us had given our opinion on that issue, important issue. Similarly, every day, Nandan, me, Chris, we all get so many messages from anger infosians on their problems. And most often we reply, we solve them within a few hours. This would not have been possible without technology. This in some sense is bringing all of us closer. Today there is this perception with an emphasis that if I have a problem, I can send a message to anybody, the chairman, the CEO, the CEO, anybody, and they will come back with some answer. So that is the positive aspects of technology. All that the point I'm making is simply this. It depends on the attitude of people. Technology is just an instrument. You can use it for a good purpose, you can use it for a bad purpose. You can use it to delay your response, you can use it to hasten your response. So my suggestion, my request to oh, all the people is use it to enhance your positive attitude, use, use technology to enhance the, the good aspects of human behavior and perhaps mitigate the not so good aspects of human behavior. Because at the end of the day, good human behavior is the key and we have to celebrate the good aspects of human behavior leveraging the power of technology. Hello? 
given we have a futurist and a visionary on stage, uh, I thought I'd ask you to predict the future, which is pretty risk-free considering we can't come back to you and hold you accountable. <laughs> So I've been in this business. I've been in this business for 25 years, and I, I can assure you, it's not terrible. safe. But. It's Conclave 2015, eight years from now. Tell me about some of the top of mind issues we'll be talking about. Tell me about some of the uh, headlines, the themes in this session. Tell me about some of the surprises, both either good or bad, that um, will be in front of us in 2015 regarding what's happening here in India, regarding globalization, um, maybe even the World Cup. Well, I'm the I'm the defer to the visionary first because he knows India better than me, and he's been to this conference before. Well, you know, 2015, uh, perhaps uh, we would all be talking of China as clearly perhaps number two economy in the world. Well, Japan is there, but who knows? Second, I, I think we, India, India would have again made considerable strides in both manufacturing and in services. We would be talking about how to compete with the developed nations even much more effectively. Uh, and as far as cricket is concerned, we'll be talking about how to retain the World Cup. Dinesh Tewit. I think they're they're controlling it from the back. So if you just talk. Yeah, they do control in my parliament. They don't don't let me speak there too. <laughs> no cricket. Just uh, on the lighter side, we just spoke to the Sri Lankans, and they know what's good for their foreign policy. So they're going to give up the cricket match today. You mentioned about uh, human behavior. Uh, taking a clue from there, do you think the advancement of technology? is going to make human being more insensitive and taking again a step forward from there you just mentioned which we have uh, imported this word from uh, perhaps western thinking and we say human being as human resource don't you think it's time when we start calling human more as source rather than resource uh, First of all, I completely agree with your sentiment. We should be very careful about our vocabulary we use because the, the terms we use often shape our reality. Um, I, I don't, it, it, human nature is a deep constant. The way it's expressed changes based on the artifacts we create, whether they're advanced technologies today or Go back, uh, there's some very interesting research where um, scientists just finished uh, tracing back the, the genome of, um, uh, of lice. So we, there are two kinds of lice that inhabit human beings. There's head lice in our hair, and there's body lice in our clothing. And, um, and you'd think, why would scientists want to go back and trace the genome of lice? Well, it turns out you can date where the genome between head lice and body lice diverged and you can very quickly determine when humans started wearing clothing and it wasn't so long ago uh, but that was a technology that profoundly changed our realities but underneath it all is is a constant of, of human desires that that haven't changed the way they express themselves change and, and that's what creates our social volatility. But it's important to keep in mind that even periods of seeming rapid change, the things that don't change are vastly greater in number than the things that do. And a lot of what we perceive as change is merely just a different kind of an expression of something deep and constant and unchanging. If you want to understand the future, pay attention 
to those deep constants, it becomes very easy. I'll take one last question from the gentleman there. I am Ravindra Agrawal. Question to Mr. Narayan Murthy. Sir, you told regarding technological advances in the urban area, there is no doubt that technological advances in future will be much faster than what they have been in India for the last 20 years. But at the same time, rural population is not geared for that type of development. You talked of schools and educational institutes, English speaking English educational institutes. Even if we start just now, it will take at least 20 years to bring that majority of rural population under English speaking when they become young for taking up technological advances. How you feel that in these 20 years, 15 to 20 years, this gap will be controlled because it will get wider day by day and what are the problems which Indian government should think just now to ensure this, that these type of problems, particularly of social and economic fronts, they do not hamper our growth. Thank you. Well, you know, I mean, you have posed a very, very difficult issue. There is no doubt at all. But at the end of the day, leadership is all about simplifying complex issues. It is all about raising the aspirations of people to come together to solve these issues. Let me once again say, I did not say that uh, we should force English on everybody. That's not what I said. What I said was, if we think that English is good for our children, the corporate leaders, the bureaucrats, the politicians, the military people, the journalists and all of that, we should at least provide an option to the parents who are not so privileged if they want to send their children to English medium school. In other words, that has to be a decision made by them and not by the state. That's the fundamental issue. Anyway, having said that, I believe that there are ways in which we can accelerate the, the, the reduction of poverty in the country. Look at China. In the last 11 years, they have moved 145 million people from rural areas into low-tech manufacturing. I don't think any other country in the history of this world has done such a massive job. If all of us the political leaders, the bureaucrats, the corporate leaders, all of us say these are the top three things that we have to do with a sense of alacrity and every week we will see how much progress we have made, we will spend 18 hours a day on this issue, I believe we can solve the problem. The biggest bottleneck we have in this country is not completing projects on time, number one. Number two, leakage of revenue, leakage of money in projects. Number three, the senior people not focusing on, on attention to details. I think if we can correct these three, I have no doubt at all that we can solve our problems. I'm going to bring this uh, session to a close, but not before I ask both these gentlemen one quick question. Both of them have been bullish on the next big thing being robots. Professor Safo, are we going to work for them? <laughs> well, the good news is they're robots and they're robots. Uh, the, the term robot evokes notions of something like Frankenstein, you know, intelligent, omniscient, and all that. I, I don't think that's likely. The, the robots won't look like things from science fiction. They'll be much more basic. But let's just for the sake of argument say that we do have, we do get a surprise in their 
you know, all-powerful, intelligent robots uh, that are overwhelming and scary. You know, my scenario is um, if, if the unlikely should happen and that arrives, the, um, and we're very lucky, they'll, they'll treat us as pets. And if we're very unlucky, they'll treat us as food. <laughs> Mr. Murthy, uh, that could, I mean, robots coding uh, down there in the Infosys campus could solve your housing and water and other problems, wouldn't it? No, I think uh, that's very unlikely. But even if it is, human mind is so flexible that we will find bigger problems to solve which will require only human mind. For example, in 1975, you know, we had this technology called code generators. Everybody said, come 1990, there won't be any need for programmers at all. But then people started using some of those code generators and they started looking at more and more complex problems. With the result, they realized that there was need for different structures, data structures, different constructs. So new languages came, new kinds of problems getting start, getting, started getting solved, uh, etc. So I, I, I don't think that will happen. However, in hazardous areas, for example, we need robots. In complex uh, microsurgeries, I do think that you would need robots. In other words, we will use robots which will supplement the strength of human beings in areas we are where we are not the best. That's what I would think. Thank you, gentlemen, for a very interesting session. Now, may I request Mr. Arun Puri, the chairman of the India Today Group, to present mementos to the speakers. Thank <laughs> you.